Hey guys, Will here. So Intel's 12th generation Alder Lake CPUs have been out for a little while now. We've had a bit of an opportunity to do some testing. So today's video is gonna be all about whether or not a Intel 12th generation Alder Lake CPU based system like the one we have here is a good option for sim racing. Let's check it out. So I guess the first question to answer here is why should you care about this? What's actually significant about 12th gen compared to previous Intel generations? So when uh, 12th gen Intel was first announced, there was one very significant thing which I thought made it stand out, particularly in the context of sim racing. Now there are some apps that a lot of gamers will be running in the background, so things like Discord, some sort of sound capture, video capture potentially, OBS Studio, streaming, Twitch, you know, all those kinds of things which a lot of gamers are running these days. But when we look at PC usage in the context of simulation, so whether that be racing or flight sim. Oftentimes we have a lot of other additional hardware on our rigs, which all requires its own software to be running in the background to operate things. So say things like your dashes, your wheels, your motion platforms, your wheelbase, uh, you know, all those things tend to have individual software packages. And what we have here in the Boosted Media Studio is pretty much a worst case scenario. We've got well over 12 different bits of software that all run in the background. And all those applications are putting what I call parasitic load on the C CPU in that they're pulling away the CPU's availability to process the main thing which you're wanting to focus on, which is the game or the simulation that you're running. So obviously you want to have as much power and system resource available to the thing that you're looking at, the game, to you know make sure that you're getting the highest frame rate and the best possible performance out of the game. And any additional load or any parasitic load that you put on the system, in addition to that, is obviously going to pull performance away from that. Now what is interesting about Intel's 12th generation CPUs is they have what's called performance core and efficiency cores, which they're able to assign tasks to uh, dynamically in real time as long as you're running Windows 11. So what that means is that the, the main game or the main sim that you're running can be running on the performance cores or one of the individual cores, depending on how the game's utilizing the CPU. And then all those other apps and resources that are running in the background can all be assigned specifically to those E cores or efficiency cores, meaning that they don't have any parasitic load impact on the cores that are responsible for actually running running the simulation. So what a lot of us will have experienced in our sim rigs, and this is something that we have seen quite regularly here at Boosted Media is, you know, your game will be running absolutely fine. Everything's running high frame rate, nice and stable. And then suddenly something happens in one of those other apps. So maybe you get a Discord notification come through, or maybe there's some sort of a spike in load as you're transitioning through different laps, for example. One of the dashes that we tested here uh, actually had an issue with this where when you started a new lap, when the counter reset, it would have a sudden spike in CPU load and you get a sudden micro stutter inside the game. So those are the kinds of scenarios that I'm hoping 12th generation Intel CPUs will address for us to give us a much smoother overall experience. So the system that we're going to be using to test with today was very kindly provided to us by a Australian company called Scorptech. They specialize in all sorts of technology, hardware, and uh, pre-built PCs as well as PC componentry. Now this is their uh, off-the-shelf pre-built PC named the Scorptech Aorus RTX 3070 Ti gaming PC. You've probably already figured out from the title there what a lot of the components here are, but just to run you quickly through exactly what we have here, we have an Intel i7-12700KF, so 12th generation Intel of course. We've got a Corsair Hydro H100X CPU cooler. We've got a Gigabyte Aorus Z690 Pro motherboard. We've got two 16 gigabyte sticks of Corsair Dominator Platinum RGB 32 gigabyte 5600 megahertz DDR5 RAM. DDR5 is obviously one of the key features of the 12th generation Intel CPUs as well. Graphics wise, we have a Gigabyte GeForce RTX 3070 Ti OC 8 gigabyte. And then for storage, we have a Samsung 970 Evo plus one terabyte M2 SSD, as well as a conventional two terabyte Seagate Barracuda hard drive for our data drive. The case is a Lian Lee Landcool 2 Mesh Blacks ATX case, and we're running a Silverstone DA850G 850 watt gold ATX power supply. So what I'll do is drop a link to Scorptech down in the description below, as well as a link to this exact PC. Now, as I said before, they do supply individual components if you do want to build your own PC. But for a lot of us these days, we just don't have the time to do that kind of stuff ourselves. So these pre-built systems are a great option. They do come from Scorptech with a two year manufacturer warranty as well. So if you do have any problems within that two years, they'll sort you out. Now I've personally been using Scorptech for a number of years here now at Boosted Media and always been very, very happy with the uh, support and uh, service that we've received. 
So yeah, absolutely no problems at all with recommending them. And again, thank you very much to them for coming on board and making today's video possible. So over the last four years or so, I've actually owned a uh, Intel CPU in pretty much every, actually was in every single generation uh, that they've had in that time. So we started with an 8700K, also had an 8086K. Uh, we had a 9900K, which we were running in our SIM PC up until very recently. Uh, we had a couple of systems that had 10700Ks in them. We recently upgraded our SIM PC to the 11900K, and you saw a video on that just a couple of months ago now on the channel. Uh, and now we have the 12700K based system. So while we, uh, while we can't compare performance directly between all of those CPUs because they are in different generations, and obviously we can't do direct comparisons between all of them, what I would recommend is you guys check out channels like Gamers Nexus, uh, Jay's Two Cents, Debauer does some really great overclocking and performance type videos as well. I'll drop some links down in the description below. Uh, particularly Gamers Nexus, they're really fantastic at doing direct comparisons between a multitude of different CPUs. But I thought the best way to start this video would be to remove the graphics card from the equation because obviously we've been running different graphics cards in a lot of these systems. A lot of the, I guess, a lot of the way things have played out, a lot of the manifestations that we've seen of things like, uh, you know, micro stuttering and micro freezes has been more as a result of, uh, you know, CPU load rather than GPU load. So a lot of the behaviors that we've seen have been pretty consistent across all of those systems that we've run uh, from a 1080 Ti all the way through to the 3090 that we're running on the system as it stands today. But what I wanted to do is start this off by doing a couple of benchmarks in Cinebench. So we're only really looking at memory, chipset and CPU performance, removing the graphics card from the equation. Basically establish somewhat of a reference point for what kind of performance uplift we're getting purely from the chipset, CPU and memory with 12th gen and then dive deeper into exactly what kind of benefits we get in the real world in the context of simulation from the new task scheduler. So don't want to get too bogged down in benchmark results today. Obviously benchmarks are only testing a few different usage cases for CPUs and different games load the CPU in different ways. So we don't want to get bogged down in the numbers too much, but there are a couple of interesting comparisons here between our results with the 12700KF and some of the previous generation CPUs. So just firstly, want to clarify around that KF designation. So the K means an unlocked multiplier, meaning that you can adjust the clock speed based on multiplier rather than having to adjust the entire system bus to increase the clock speed. The F is whether or not the CPU has an onboard graphics processor. So what we mean by that is whether it's enabled or not, I suppose you should say. Now, from what I understand through the quality assurance process, if a chip has a dud graphics processor, that will be binned as an F processor. And basically what that means is that they disable the graphics processor on it, sell it as a chip, which has no graphics processing as opposed to the non-F versions or the 12700K in this, uh, in this instance, which does have onboard integrated graphics. Now, the only thing just to consider with that is that many graphics cards will only allow you to output to three monitors. So if you are wanting to run a fourth monitor on a SIM rig, it's often worth at least considering getting the uh, K version rather than the KF version, just so you can run that fourth monitor. But there are a couple of other ways around it too, but just something to consider there. So just having a quick look at the results here, we can see single core performance is quite a jump up from the 11900K and 11700K, which was the previous generation. And going back through the different generations, you can see there are relatively uh, relatively consistent jumps between those generations. The jump between the 11900K is a slightly bigger jump though than it has been with previous generations. But the really interesting thing here is the jump in multi-core performance on the 12700K from the previous generations. Now we are running Cinebench here, which is a general pretty good all-rounder representation of the CPU's general performance. But again, as I said before, the uh, performance variances between different generations will vary depending on the type of load that you're putting on the CPU. Obviously different SIM titles will load the CPU differently as well. So this is just a, you know, a bare bones sort of indication here. But the jump there in multi-core performance from 16,211 on the 11900K processor up to 22,573 on the 12700K is a pretty massive jump. And looking back through the data there, you can see to get a jump that big, you actually have to go back across three generations. So all the way back to the 9700K uh, and comparing that to the 11700K processor to get that bigger jump again. So I thought that was worth including here simply because it is a good way of illustrating just how big a jump it is to 12th gen from the previous generations. And I'm hoping that this is gonna translate into a significant performance boost in the real world as well. 
So let's run through a couple of benchmarks and I just want to quickly explain the methodology here. So what I've tried to do is create a scenario where we're primarily focusing on the impact that the CPU has on the overall experience rather than the GPU. Now, most games these days, if you're cranking the graphics settings up really high, do tend to be GPU bound, and that can kind of mask a lot of the issues that might come to play from the CPU. So what I've done here is run triple 1440 in all cases, and I've tweaked the graphics settings in each of the games to try and maintain a stable frame rate at around the sort of 80 to 100 frames per second. But we're not really focusing on the maximum frame rate here or the average frame rate. Really what we're focusing on here is the 1% lows and 0.1% loads and what that means is the worst frame rate that you get 1% of the time and the worst frame rate that you get 0.1% of the time. So even if you're getting a relatively high and stable frame rate, if there are any frame skips or micro stutters and things like that, if it's happening frequently enough it'll show up in the 1% lows. If it's happening even less frequently then it's going to tend to show up in the 0.1% lows. Now there's a lot of other factors at play there as well obviously you know if you've got a sudden change in lighting, a whole bunch of volumetric fog or something like that that suddenly pops up then that is going to have an impact here as well. Well, so it's impossible to create a scenario that's absolutely perfect for testing this and we will run through a couple of things after the benchmarks as well which will illustrate the uh, influence of the CPU in a little bit more detail here but the focus here is not on the average frame rate more on the 1% lows and 0.1% lows and the differences between them. So we'll start off with F1 2022 on the 12700K we're averaging 97.2 frames with a 1% low of 56.5 and 0.1% low of 44.6 doing the exact same test with the same graphics card on my 11900K system. Very close in terms of the average frame rate. You can see a slightly higher average frame rate with the 12700K, but the 1% low was significantly lower there at 44 frames per second and 0.1 even more so at 29.5 frames per second down from 44.6. Looking at a Seto Corsa Competizione next, which does tend to be even more GPU thirsty. Average of 85.1 frames per second there on the 12700K with a 1% low of 68 and 0.1% low of 40 frames per second. 11900K for comparison, again, with the identical graphics card, average frame rate of 84.3. So again, very, very close on average. 1% lows there weren't quite such a big jump, 59.9, so 10 frames less on the 1% low. 0.1% low was 38.2 down from 40 frames per second. So not really a significant jump there in a set of course of competition. And I'd imagine that's probably because we are a little bit more GPU bound than uh, in some of the other titles that we're looking at. So Automobilista 2, now average frame rate of 93 frames per second, 1% low of 74.9, 0.1% low of 74.6. So a much smaller variation in frame rate. So on the 11900K, we saw 90.4 frames per second, 61.6 and 57.2 for our 1% lows. And then down to iRacing, we had an average of 119 frames per second. iRacing is an older game using older technology, so it does tend to run slightly higher frame rate than you see in some of the other titles that we tested here, and that was intentional. We wanted to sort of try and have as big a mix as we could. So 119 frames per second with the 3070 Ti on the 12700K, 1% low of 84.9 and 0.1% low of 73 frames per second. On the 11900K, again with identical graphics card, 118.2 frames per second, 80.6 frames per second, 1% low, and 0.1% low of 64.1 frames per second. Now, of course, not all of these variances can be attributed directly to the CPU. It is impossible to test exactly like for like here because obviously they are separate PCs, different operating systems, of course. There's going to be a few different variances in the install, the freshness of the install, of course, as well. So there are a couple of factors in there that could account for these variances. I'm certainly not saying that, you know, it's absolutely as black and white as what it might look from these benchmarks, and I want to make sure that's clear. But there is definitely a, a pattern, well, there's two patterns that are quite clear from these results at least, and that is that the average frame rate was slightly higher across all the titles that we tested with the 12700K than it was with the 11900K. And also across all titles, we can see that the 1% lows and 0.1% lows weren't quite as low on the 12700K as they were with the 11900K. So let's move on now and do a bit of a real world demonstration on how the task scheduling works with the 12th gen CPUs. So before we finish up with our conclusions on 12th gen, I just wanted to quickly run you through a real world demonstration of how different CPU loads are assigned to either P or performance cores or E or efficiency cores on a, I guess a real life scenario here. So we've got this set up as a desktop PC. Most people that are doing sim racing 
don't have a dedicated SIM PC like we do. They're running their everyday desktop PC, the same thing that they're using for you know web browsing and all those kinds of tasks as well as their SIM racing. So what we've got here is a Seto Corsa Competizione running in a window. Now we don't need to worry about the frame rate, so to speak here, because obviously that's gonna depend on the graphics settings, the you know visual quality, and also the window size, resolution, and all those things. What we're interested in here is purely just the load on the CPU that's being generated as we're running the game. And then what we're gonna do is open up a bunch of other apps in the foreground and see how they influence the load on the CPU. So, and that should give us a really good indication of exactly how the scheduler is assigning those, uh, those different loads to different areas of the CPU. So what we have here is CPU ID hardware monitor running in the background. And we can see here our P core load and our E core load. I've also got task manager running here as well, just to give you an idea of what we've got running in the background. Pretty typical kind of stuff here. So I've got Adobe Creative Cloud as well as hardware monitor and task manager, and then ACC running there. No other foreground apps are running, and then just a bunch of background processes. So 92 background processes in total. That's gonna be you know some of our drivers that are running in the background, antivirus, anti-malware, you know all those kinds of typical things. So as it stands right now, we'll click across to the performance tab. We can see our total CPU utilization or our total CPU you load is sitting at around the sort of 25 to 35 percent mark hovering around something around there and then our p core load over here is sitting at around 25 percent and our e core load or our efficiency cores are sitting at around about the 0.5 to about 3%, somewhere around there. So at the moment, the E cores are responsible for operating pretty much everything outside of the game. If I were to close that game off, you would see the P cores drop down to around sort of 5%. And what it's doing is it's dynamically assigning that load to give you the most efficient performance. So just because you're not doing a performance intensive task doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna park all of the performance cores. What it's gonna do is it's gonna assign that affinity or assign that uh, assign that load to give you the most responsive experience on the PC. And that's all done by the Windows 11 scheduler working in conjunction with the, uh, with the motherboard and CPU, of course. So, what I want to do now is open up Discord, a typical kind of app that you would see running on most people's gaming PCs. So I'm going to open up a web browser now as well. So we open up Chrome, being a relatively resource hungry browser, and we can see straight away there our e cores have jumped up to, it's spiked up to around about 15% there, sitting around 8 to 15%. So we're getting a little bit of an increase in our P cores. And obviously what it's doing is it's scaling that load dynamically. At the moment, obviously the game isn't putting a high amount of load on the CPU. So it's able to you know, spare some of that P core resource and uh, use it for some of these tasks. But this is where we're sort of, this is where it kind of ties back into the benchmark results that we looked at before, where we're not seeing those, uh, those same lows we're not seeing the same kind of, uh, I guess, resource hogging or parasitic load on the CPU. You know, that gives us things like micro stars, which we have experienced with other earlier generation CPUs, but we haven't experienced so far at least with the 12th gen CPUs. Now what I wanna do also is open up OBS Studio here as well. This is another typical app that a lot of people would be running. So I'm gonna keep a video running here in the background on, um, on YouTube. We might just bring that up out of the way so it is actually having to draw what's being uh, displayed there. So now we've got OBS Studio here working as well, which is a typical kind of application that you would use for screen capturing. So interestingly, what we can see here is that even though we have a browser running with a video, we've got Discord running here as well. We've got OBS running with the, uh, with the preview running there as well. We still only have sort of somewhere between 25 to 30% CPU utilization on our P cores but our average e-core utilization is sitting higher than it was previously. Before it was sitting between zero and about 3% when we had nothing running in the background other than just those background apps and of course our monitoring apps. Now we're seeing somewhere sort of between 5%, 10%, somewhere around there. So it's definitely sitting higher. Now what I'm gonna do is actually start doing some capturing here as well. Now I've specifically set this to X264 and I've done that because I want it to use CPU rather than uh, NVE and C for the encoding. So we're gonna start recording now. And what we should see here is again, a jump in E-Core activity. So yeah, we can see there, now our E-Cores are sitting a little bit high. It is, it's, it's interesting how it is dropping back down again. I guess the kind of activities that we're doing here aren't putting a massive amount of load on the CPU, but again, definitely sitting higher than it was before. Now, if we stop that recording and change that to NVENC, so if we go recording 
hardware encoding and apply and now hit record again what are we going to see here so yeah you can see the load on the e cores is now a lot lower than it was before it's sitting again as if we weren't really even doing anything in terms of the cpu other than just the load that's being induced by these other background apps so sitting at around the sort of five to 15 percent mark so it's interesting to see again we're not just seeing you know as soon as we do a um as soon as we do a different task we're not just seeing the load go through the roof on the e course we are seeing i guess a little bit more dynamically than i perhaps expected to see here the load kind of being balanced between the p cores and e cores for the most efficient uh, experience so as it stands right now we've got a youtube video playing we've got discord open and we've also got a screen capture happening in nvnc with our preview open and we're hovering around the sort of five to 15 percent mark on the e cores and still sitting at around sort of 27 to 33 percent on our performance core so what i'm going to do now is actually close all of these things off so we're going to stop recording first and immediately we see a drop in e core and p core activity so p cores went down to 24 to 28 percent load and e cores dropped down to to about two to seven percent we're going to close off obs entirely now and that has actually dropped things a little bit lower on the p cores so 22 to 26 percent e cores are now hovering at around the sort of one to two percent mark we're going to close off our browser now as well so when we actually did that when we when we did an activity this, the uh, the the load actually spiked up for a moment but then once it was closed it dropped down so our p cores are sitting down at around the sort of 22 to 24% mark. E cores are now in the 0.6% to 2% range. We're gonna close off Discord as well. We'll actually have to close that from the, uh, from the task manager as well, because closing it doesn't actually close it or kill the application. There we go. So we're back to pretty much where we started now. P cores sitting at around 22 to 25% load just from the game, and E cores sitting at about 0 to 1.5%. If I now close off a set of Corsair as well, we should see activity drop right down. So P cores now sitting at zero to about 5% load and our E cores still hovering at 0.1 to about 1.1% load. And there's very, very little running on the system at all. All we've got running here is just Creative Cloud as well as Hardware Monitor, Task Manager, and then our 93 background process. And you can see just how little load on those cores those background processes are actually having or how little influence they're having or parasitic load they're putting on the system so i thought that would be an interesting little real world demonstration there just to give you a uh, visual representation of exactly what's going on there i actually expected to see i guess a more stark difference between the p core and e core load but i guess that just goes to show how much work the scheduler is doing dynamically in the background to make sure that you know you're getting the most efficient performance there without any detrimental impact on uh, you know the thing that you're actually wanting to pay attention to in this case a set of course of competition you know so interesting to sort of look at that in conjunction with what we saw in the benchmark results but let's move on now into the conclusions so wrapping all of this up now i've been making some notes on my laptop here as we've been going through all the various different tests and bits and pieces in putting today's video together so first let's talk about the uh scorp tech aurus uh, 3070 ti system as a whole uh look overall we've been quite impressed with the performance of it obviously it is a lower spec machine in terms of the graphics card than what we're used to running here in the studio so we did have to adjust our expectations accordingly of course obviously we're used to running a 3090 to drive our triple 4k screens but we did find that the 3070 Ti was sufficient for running triple 1440 screens at sort of medium to high settings. Again, remembering that uh, different SIM titles will put different amounts of load on the GPU. So instead of course, of Competiciani, we were able to get a pretty comfortable 85 frames per second average with medium to high graphics settings and ray tracing turned down. If we look at something like eye racing, we were able to achieve over 100 frames per second average most of the time with again, medium to high graphics settings. So that's 1440 triples. I think the 3070 is gonna be more than enough to satisfy most people in that regard. So the performance of the system on the whole is quite well balanced. Obviously, if you do go for a 3080 or a 3080 Ti, something like that, or even a 3090, then you're gonna boost the performance even more, but you will need to get a more beefy power supply to run those GPUs as well. So a well thought out, well designed system. I do like the case as well. Everything's nice and easily accessible. And I think if you're the sort of person that you know, maybe isn't interested in learning how to build yourself, or you just don't have the time to build yourself, then something like this is a very good option. So thanks again to Scorp Tech for sending this across to us for the purpose of today's video. But let's focus a little bit more now 
on the star of the show, which is the 12th gen CPU from Intel. So in the testing that we've done over the last couple of days, the 12700K absolutely represents the biggest generational leap in performance that we've seen between generations on Intel CPUs since the eighth generation when we started testing with them back in 2018. So I've had, as I mentioned at the start of the video, I've had an 8700K, a 9900K, 10700, 10900, 11900, and now the 12700. Uh, look, the performance in the real world in terms of sim racing at least between all of those CPUs between the 8700K and the uh, and the 11900K hasn't been absolutely massive. I'd say probably the 8700K to the 9900K was probably the biggest jump for me. And again, we don't have access to every single CPU across every single tier or range here. So it's impossible for me to give you clear conclusions between all of them. But of course, there are a whole bunch of other videos available online which compare them more directly. But in the context of sim racing, the uplift in performance between 9th, 10th, and 11th generation just hasn't really been enough that we could really recommend to you guys that it was worthwhile upgrading if you already owned a ninth generation to a 10th gen or an 11th gen or something like that. And that was something that we discussed when we built the 11th gen system uh, relatively recently here on the channel. So look, if you had an 8th gen, I would have said, yeah, maybe go to a 10th gen or something like that if you were struggling with performance. But even just looking at those benchmarks, you could see the raw performance upgrade between the uh, between the 11th gen, the 11900K and the 12700K that we're testing here wasn't massive in terms of average frame rates. It wasn't even all that massive in terms of of what we saw with 1% lows and 0.1% lows. But the actual experience of using the system, I just found it was a little bit more snappy and we didn't experience a single micro stutter the entire time that we were testing, which I did think was quite significant. And I'm not sure exactly because we did see some quite low numbers in those 0.1% lows and 1% lows. And I was actually surprised to see that in the testing because it wasn't something that I actually perceived when I was driving. So what I'm imagining is that was probably, you know, momentary drops in frame rate when we had a lot of fog on the screen, if we were having a skid or something like that. And I did sort of try to use replay files so we could test consistently between the two systems. But I did sort of try to make those so that there was a lot of different things going on, a lot of different lighting effects and stuff like that. So I'm guessing that that was probably more of the influence on those frame rates rather than, you know, things like micro stuttering, because uh, we just didn't really experience it. Now, again, that is going to depend on the system that you're running. If you're running an older system with a lot of peripherals connected to your system that are putting a lot of parasitic load on your CPU, then you might experience a lot of micro stuttering. If you've already got a really high-end system like a you know a 10900K or something like that, and you're running relatively low resolution, a high, high-end graphics card, then you might not be getting any micro stuttering or any of those sort of problems to begin with. So look, I think what we've demonstrated here is that there isn't a absolutely massive uplift in performance enough to upgrade from a system that you're already happy with. But I think if you've got an older system that you're maybe not happy with already and wanting to, wanting to look at upgrading, then I think what we've demonstrated here is that the 12th gen CPUs from Intel not only represent a pretty significant uplift in raw performance, at least in terms of benchmark from the previous generation, but I think these 12th gen CPUs will be a solid backbone for at least the next few generations of graphics cards to come. I don't think that you're gonna be needing to upgrade your CPU again for a couple of years if you do go with something like a 12700K, although you may end up if you're wanting to run super high resolutions or you know maybe one of the more recent VR headsets, something like that, you may wanna look at upgrading the graphics card at some point down the track. Now, another really important thing to consider here is that to take advantage of the scheduling features which we've looked at for 12th generation CPUs, you will need to have Windows 11 running. Now, I'm happy to say we've actually been running Windows 11 on a number of systems here at Boosted Media right since the beta version was released to the public, probably six, it had to be six or seven months ago now. I have remained with Windows 10 on my main sim racing PC purely because I had so many different peripherals that plugged into that and I was terrified of upgrading and then potentially having something not work. Now, happy to say that in our case, all the hardware that we have here, which is a lot of hardware, did work with Windows 11. We didn't see any sort of detrimental impact on the overall performance in terms of frame rates or anything like that as demonstrated in the benchmarks that we've looked at today. But you will just need to make sure that if you are running some obscure piece of hardware, hardware, maybe an older piece of hardware, a wheelbase or something like that, you will just need to make sure that that is Windows 11 compatible because the last thing you want to do is have a shiny new system and end up having to install Windows 10 on it, not being able to take advantage of those features just because you need it for some older hardware. So definitely factor that in as well. So hopefully that's helped you out guys. I know there's quite a bit of ambiguity there. It is really hard 
to test these kinds of scenarios. And I've done my best here to sort of try and represent with numbers and with things that are tangible to you guys in the, in the context of the video, the actual experience of using this system over the last couple of weeks. So for me, it boils down to a pretty simple equation of, are you happy with the system that you have already? Is the system that you have already doing everything you need? If it is, then I don't see any massive reason to you know set your heart on a 12th gen CPU. I think if you're you know maybe not quite happy with the system that you have, if it's starting to struggle a little bit with some of the more recent games, maybe you've just upgraded your monitors, you're wanting to run higher resolution, maybe you're looking at a more recent VR headset, then I think the 12th generation CPUs are definitely a contender there and definitely something that is worthwhile considering. I would have had a hard time recommending an 11th gen CPU. I know we did a video on that quite recently and there were some specific reasons why that suited us at the time that we built that system, but this is definitely a better CPU for gaming and specifically sim racing than the 11th generation was and it definitely represents a bigger generational leap in performance as well, whichever way you look at it, however you package it and you know throughout all the tests that we've done over the last couple of days in putting together this video. So if you're wanting to upgrade already and you know that you're going to be spending some money on a new system, it's definitely worth considering a system like this, definitely worth considering a 12th gen CPU. But if you're already happy with the system that you have, then maybe it'll pay to just wait a little bit longer, see what's down the road. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see future generations, future upgrades have this kind of performance leap as well, because this is something that is very exciting. And I'm personally hoping that we'll see future generations have this kind of performance upgrade again. So that is it for today's video. Hopefully it's helped you guys out. If it has, please do leave a thumbs up, consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss future content. And we'll see you again soon. Bye.